Psalms chapter 2, if you would. We're going to read through the whole psalm together, and then we're just going to kind of break it down. I'm going to give you some thoughts that, uh, that the, I believe the Lord put on my heart about Psalm chapter 2. All right, so Psalm chapter 2 has 12 verses, and uh, I'm going to ask you if you can figure out who wrote this psalm, and then I'll give you the answer to that here in just a little bit. We'll go to the New Testament and find the answer to that, and uh, just teach a little lesson. There's a lot of lessons tonight from this one psalm. Psalm chapter 2, look at verse number 1. Why do the heathen rage, and the people of a- imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, now wait a minute, you're not reading the newspaper. You're not reading today's news feed. You're reading the Bible. And this was written thousand years ago or more. Actually, probably we're looking at um, 2,500 2, years ago. This was written. But it's just as relevant today as it was back then. All right, so why are the heathen raging? Why are the people imagining a vain thing? The kings of the earth and the rulers, right? We're going to be talking about them a lot tonight. They took counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall He speak unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me. Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and ye perish from the way. When His wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. That's Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2 is known as one of the Messianic Psalms. The Messianic Psalm would be a psalm that talks about the Messiah or about Jesus. Now there's going to be some different words that you're going to hear about uh, that, uh, that represent this word um, uh, Messiah. All right, so you've got Messiah, you've got Christ, you've got anointed one, all meaning pretty much the same thing. So who wrote this psalm? And here's one of the really neat things about the Bible. If you don't understand part of the Bible or you want to know something more about part of the Bible, a lot of times you can look to another part of the Bible and find out about it. So there's going to be another part of the Bible that's going to give us some more information about this, this particular book of the Bible. Now, I didn't know this, but whenever I went over to Acts chapter 4, you find out who wrote this. So go ahead and turn there. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 24. We're going to find out who wrote this. And, and uh, so you've got the, the disciples that are being persecuted, and they've been thrown into jail. They've been... Uh, They've been uh, warned, they've been threatened, and they've been released. And Acts chapter 4, verse 24, the Bible says, When they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Right? So they've just been persecuted. This is right after the chapter where Peter and John were up going up to the temple to pray. They healed the lame man. Persecution happens. They've been arrested. Now they've been released. And now they're praying. Acts 4.25, look look what they say. Who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage? And the people imagine vain things. Hey, we just saw that, didn't we? That's a direct quote from Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. All right, then he goes on. uh, They go on in verse 26, Acts chapter 4, verse 26. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. You see that comparison there? The kings of the earth, I'm reading the Psalms, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying. And then Psalm chapter 1 goes on and gives us more, but I want to read a little bit more of Acts. Acts chapter 4, verse 26. So they say, um, basically, God, you've heard this, you've seen this, you're the God that's made heaven and earth, you've seen this persecution, you see what's going on, you see we've been arrested, you've seen that we've been threatened not to speak in the name of Jesus. 
And then, you knew all this, didn't you? Because you already said this back in Psalm chapter 2. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth stood up. This is Acts 4.26 again. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His Christ. Verse 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. So they're, they're, they're saying, God, we're, we're in the middle of this persecution. We've got these kings. We've got these leaders. They've risen it up. In fact, these, these human leaders of people, these, these uh, local leaders, world leaders, these people have risen up so much that they killed the Son of God. They killed the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. But in verse 28, they acknowledge that God didn't just allow it, but this was God's, uh, by His hand and His counsel, determined before to be done. So you see this, Psalm chapter 2, if you go back there, was written by David, quoted by the apostles in Acts chapter 4. Let's break the Psalms down. All right, Why did the heathen rage? Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. Why did the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So first of all, in this first passage, this first three verses, you see this. People have rejected God. I don't need to probably prove that to you, but I'm going to, all right? The, the people have rejected God. We have rejected God. The heathen rage, the Bible says. And then it says the people imagine vain things. I read that passage and I thought back to the flood. Right before the flood, the Bible says, Genesis 6, 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Bible says the heathen are raging against God. They're, they're imagining these vain things. There's these, these thoughts in their minds that are they're vain. They're, they're evil even. Can you turn to a few more places? We're going to go to lots of places tonight. Romans chapter 1. Could you go there? There's a couple places in Romans chapter 1 that, that point this out. I want you to look at just a couple verses here. So this is, this is David. We're thinking... Um, I'm not sure, uh, probably 500 years before Christ. Maybe more than that, 800 years. Maybe somebody, um, you can tell me. Does anybody know that? Kevin, you know that one? Daniel's 400. So probably, we're probably looking at probably six to 800 years. Maybe something like that. So six to 800 years before Christ was born, you've got this being written down. This is before Jesus was born, before he was a, um, a, a king on the earth, before... He came that the first time, you know, this crown with thorns. Next time he's coming, as the, you're wearing the crown of a king. Before he took a step on the earth as a, as a human who was you know, born of woman, before all of that ever happened, God gives us this, this passage of Scripture. Did you find Romans chapter 1? Look at verse number 20. And God said, all this time before it happened, the heathen are rejecting, the raging people are rejecting God. And the imagination of the thoughts of their heart, their, their imaginations are, are vain, they're imagining vain things. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him, talking about God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but, look at this phrase, became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. And it goes on to say, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changing the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and creeping things, and it goes on. So the people have rejected God, the heathen rage, they're imagining vain things, they're imagining evil things, but also false things. The Bible says they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, 
and creeping things. So the, these heathen, the Psalms chapter 2, the heathen rage, the people imagine these vain things, and it's going to talk about these kings and leaders in a minute. You'll see how this all ties together. These false things. For some reason, the heathen, the people that are against God, they reject God, they've got in their minds that they are very wise. We know a lot. We're very wise. We're very smart. We know we are more informed than other people like us, or, or we, we are more informed than people that lived before us. So, you know, don't we think that sometimes? That people lived uh, 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago, or our parents, right, our parents. The last generation, we're so much smarter than them. We know so much more than people back then. So that's what they're saying. They claim to be wise, but they were fools. They were so foolish, in fact, they worship people, birds, animals, and bugs. That's pretty, that's pretty foolish right there. You say they don't worship bugs. No, really. I remember looking at the, uh, what the Egyptians worship, and they actually worship these beetles, right? Actually, bugs that you'd worship. I don't know if anybody would ever worship a spider, but probably somebody at some point did, right? They convinced themselves, listen to this, that instead of God creating everything in six days, like the Bible says, that everything evolved from nothing. They professed themselves to be wise, but in doing that, they just became fools. They believed that life spontaneously started. The rocks became bugs. Bugs became animals. Animals became people. And people are becoming gods. That's exactly what they believe. The Bible says that they, the heathen are raging against God. The people imagine a vain thing. This is total imagination. The, the science books will say something like millions and millions of years ago, but really what they should say once upon a time, because it's imagination, it's a fairy tale. People have rejected God, the heathen rage, people imagine a vain thing, and it goes on in verse number two. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed the, the kings and rulers of the earth opposed God. It was, it was the way back then when David was writing. It's been the way all through history, and it's that way now. They set themselves against God. For the most part, if you're to look at history, you see that the rulers of the world, world leaders, have chosen an anti-God position. Not all of them. There have been some good leaders. But if you just look at history, you see... How many, the great majority of these leaders, have set themselves kings and judges or rulers of the earth? They set themselves to oppose God, an anti-God position. In fact, they've gone further than that. They've taken counsel together against God. What are they doing? Counsel together. They're working together to fight against the plans and purposes of God. Look at verse 3. What do they say? The kings of the earth and these judges, these rulers, they... they uh, they take counsel together against the Lord, against His anointed, saying, verse number 3, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. The plans and purposes of God, a lot of people would probably say those bands and, and cords represent certain specific things. I'm just going to call them the plans and purposes of God tonight. They take counsel together against God. I, I read tonight, or today, you, can, you could turn there if you would, Genesis chapter 11 it's just a great example of this, these rulers of the earth getting together to defy God, to change God's plans. And in Genesis chapter 11, you've got the story of the Tower of Babel. What, a, what an interesting story this is. It's not that long after the flood, you've got this guy named Nimrod. Nimrod, the Bible says, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. So they said, Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. All right, that's what he was known as. So Nimrod goes, he starts this city, and one of the cities he starts, I think the first one was Babel. Well, they start, I don't think they called it that at the time, but after, after what God did, they did call that. He starts building this city, and in Genesis chapter 11, verse 4, and they said, go to, let us build a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Here's our plan. Something about that plan didn't sit right with God. We don't know all the details there. We don't know what they were planning to do, but they imagined something that was so displeasing to God that He changed their languages and spread them all over the earth. The Bible doesn't give us the details. God doesn't say what it was that they were imagining. 
And I don't believe that God was just trying to keep them oppressed. I, I believe that they were imagining to do something that was going to go so much in the face of God. It may have been building a world religion. A lot of people would say that may be what it was. And that uh, Babylonianism would have started there, which came into to so many different religions, and you can trace it all back to that point. I wouldn't disagree with that. That may be what it was. I just can't prove that. Whatever it was, God, in verse 5, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, look at this phrase, which they have imagined to do. Stay there, but back in Psalms chapter 2, verse 1, it said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Maybe the Tower of Babel was them trying to uh, gain their way into heaven by, by working their way to heaven. I'm not exactly sure what it was, but whatever it was, their imagination was leading them the wrong direction. So God says in verse 7, Go, let, go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Just a, just a great illustration of this, this group of people working together to fight against the plans and purposes of God. And again, God doesn't give us the details in Genesis chapter 11 of what they were doing, but it, it was so against God that He scattered them around the world and stopped what they were doing. The Bible says they, they fight against God's plans and purposes, and it says they, they take counsel together against God's anointed. Let's break that phrase down just for a minute. Are, are you all ready to think tonight? Okay, hope you're ready to work a little bit tonight because we're going we're gonna to all break a sweat at Bible study tonight, working, thinking so hard. You ready for that? I already broke a sweat. My sweat's been broken for a long time. Okay, that was supposed to be it was an attempt at humor. Okay, let's move on. Look at this phrase. Thank you, Miles. Look at this phrase. Take counsel together. The Bible says the rulers take counsel together. Let's think about that. What's that mean? It means to conspire, right? They get together to get counsel. It's like a group of people getting together to come up with a plan. The Bible says they take counsel together against somebody, against his or God's anointed. And who is that? Jesus Christ, the Messiah. The phrase take counsel together means to conspire. And world leaders throughout history have conspired against Jesus. Now, I know as soon as I say the word conspire, we get labeled in with a group of people of conspiracy theorists, right? Now, some conspiracy theories are out there. But right here, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is the fact. God says these leaders of the world, these kings, these rulers have conspired together. This isn't a theory. This is a conspiracy against Jesus Christ. God doesn't use the word conspiracy. He says take counsel together. We'll probably stick with that, or else we'll get deleted off of Facebook. That's another conspiracy theory. All right, but let's think about this. Throughout history, world leaders have despised the name of Jesus. I'm going to give you some examples of that. Christians are representatives of Christ. You realize that, right? So world leaders have historically despised Christians also. I want you to think about this. When Jesus started, if you want to call Christianity a religion, the Bible mentions that it is true religion and undefiled before God is this. So it's, if we were to call Christianity a religion, I would call it a faith probably because the word religion just has so many different meanings nowadays. But the religion of Christ, I'm quoting from a, a booklet called The Trail of Blood. The religion of Christ began as a religion not of this world. Its founder gave it no earthly head and no worldly power. It did not seek establishment or state or governmental support. It did not seek the dethronement of Caesar. Its author, Jesus, said, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And since it was a spiritual religion, it was not a rival of any earthly government. At the same time, its members were taught to respect all civil law 
and government. This is an amazing thing. This group that Jesus started was supposed to obey the law. They were supposed to submit to government. And they weren't trying to overthrow the government. Yet, most world leaders have fought against this group. What is it? Well, they conspired. They took counsel together against God's anointed. They took counsel together. They conspired against Jesus. You can go all the way back in history, starting with the local leaders in Jerusalem when Jesus was crucified. You've got a conspiracy or a, a taking counsel together to kill Jesus. The Jewish leaders, Annas and Caiaphas and the high priests and the other priests, the Roman Empire at the time against Jesus. You've got uh, Pilate, you've got Herod, you've got Tiberius Caesar, who, were, uh, the, who was the emperor at the time. they got to remember the Roman Empire was pagan. When Jesus walked on the earth, the Roman Empire was a, a religion of many gods. It was a religion established by law and supported by the government. The pagan religion of the Roman Empire was the, the official religion of Rome. It was sanctioned. It was established. The law established it. The government supported it. John the Baptist was murdered by Herod. Jesus was crucified under the authority of Herod and Pilate. James, the brother of John, was killed by Herod, the Bible says, with a sword. Stephen was stoned, you could say, by Saul, although he didn't do anything. He just held the coats of the people that did it. And the Bible says he was consenting to their death. I, I think very strongly that he was responsible for Stephen's stoning. He was a representative of the Jewish leadership. The rest of the apostles were murdered by either Jewish leaders or pagan Roman leaders. Listen to this list. Matthew killed in Ethiopia. Mark dragged through the streets until he died. Luke was hanged. Peter and Simeon were crucified. Andrew was tied to a cross. James was beheaded. Philip was crucified and stoned. Bartholomew was flayed alive. Thomas was pierced with lances. James, the less, the other James, was thrown from the temple and beaten to death. Jude shot to death with arrows. Matthias stoned to death. And then Paul beheaded under the authority of Nero. Now, you've got to understand, often the government leaders, like kings or emperors or governors, partnered with an established religion to fight against God's people. Here's an example. Constantine claimed to become a Christian and made Christianity the official religion of Rome. This may have been the largest merger in history between paganism and the New Testament church. The result was a religion that was similar to the church that Jesus started in some ways, but so different that it was not any longer the same church. And it eventually became known as the Catholic Church, which means universal church. And for the first time in history, I want, you to, I want this to sink in. For the first time in history, Christians in name were killing Christians in doctrine. Let this sink in for a minute. Christians were killing Christians, the Christians who said they were Christians because they were part of this this Roman church, were killing the Christians who said they were Christians because they were following Christ. Through the Dark Ages, through the Middle Ages, world leaders despised followers of Jesus. And they hunted them down and killed them. We don't have time tonight to look at all the, the illustrations. I, I read a story not long ago about the there's a group of people in Piedmont in Europe called the Piedmontese, I believe is what they are called. There's a famous poem written about them, and one of these days we'll, we'll read the stories to them. Just amazing how the, the official church, the state church, the government church hunted them down. They, they left, and they were trying to hide in the mountains just to have a peaceful life, and they were hunted down and killed in just barbaric ways. In more recent times, leaders of communist countries have shown their hatred for Jesus. Now, as I did some research for this, I, I stumbled across just some thoughts, and I thought they'd just be so timely, not because of coronavirus, but in a country who is so divided on so many of our people want to become socialist, and, and so many of our people want to still have freedom. And, and, and as I, I studied this, and I realized 
these, these people, the kings of the earth, they set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against Jesus. We need to be familiar with this history. I just want to, I found the, a libra, the Library of Congress has a series of articles I found today called Revelations from the Russian Archives. So basically what they did was they, they found letters written from Lenin and from Stalin and from a guy named Gorky. I haven't done the research on who he is. He's one of the leaders. Um, um, Moltov. He's famous for the Moltov cocktails, right? Um, we'll, we'll, and I just want you to hear just a little bit of that. These people that have risen up against God, the heathen rage, they imagine a vain thing. And if we can get through this, I want to show you God's solution at the end of this chapter. All right, so we'll go through this quickly. The Soviet Union was the first state to have as an ideological objective the elimination of religion. Their goal was to eliminate it. And toward that end, the communist regime confiscated church pop property, ridiculed religion, harassed believers, and propagated atheism in the schools. Their goal, get rid of religion. The main target of the anti-religious campaign in the 1920s and 1930s was the Russian Orthodox Church. Now, we wouldn't agree doctrinally with the Russian Orthodox Church. They'd be very similar to a, to a Catholic Church, and we would believe very differently doctrinally. But you need to understand, what the Russians were trying to do is get rid of all religion. The Russian Orthodox Church had the largest number of faithful people. Nearly all of its clergy and many of its believers or members or people that followed them were shot or sent to labor camps. Theological schools were closed and church publications were prohibited. By 1939, only about 500 of over 50,000 churches remained open. Here's what you need to understand. Before this, there were a lot of churches. There were Russian Orthodox churches. There were Protestant churches. There were Baptist churches. There were a lot of, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of these churches. But by the time of about 1945, well, here it says 1939, only a handful of these churches remain. Here's what we need to understand. They weren't that different from us before this happened. And then the leaders, the heathen raged, and the kings of the earth and the rulers took counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, just like Psalm chapter 2 says. Attacks on Judaism were endemic throughout the Soviet period. I'm just reading from the article from the Library of Congress. Uh, the organized practice of Judaism became almost impossible. Protestant denominations and other sects were also persecuted. The All-Union Council of Evangelical Christian Baptists, established by the government in 1944, typically, this is even, this is, these are even the ones that were established by the government. So they, they wouldn't even line up with where we are, but still the, the government was so, so forceful, they were forced to confine their activities to the narrow act of worship and denied most opportunities for religious teaching and publication. Basically what the government said to that group this, uh, let me read the name of it again. The All-Union Council of Evangel Evangelical Christian Baptists. That's basically the government Baptists, or the socialist Baptists of the time. Even that group was told, you're allowed to worship, but that's all. You know, that's not far from what we've heard in America and not that long ago. A letter from a Russian leader to Joseph Stalin said this, I'm going to read a bit of this letter. I, I, want, I want you to think this through. I, I just, you've got to understand the mindset of the communists, and I want you to see some of the similarities between those people that want to turn our country into a socialist country. Why? Because they're imagining a vain thing, the heathen rage. They set themselves, they take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Kind of a by the way, but I just thought of this. The same people... The same ideological system that will do what we're talking about doing here, Joseph Stalin and Lenin, the ones that want to turn our country into a socialist country, are the ones that are promoting and loudly trumpeting that we ought to be killing our own babies. We need to understand that. That's the same group. All right. So the leftist socialist group, 
And I want you just to see some similarities here as we read some letters to and from Stalin and Lenin as well, these leaders of communism in Russia. So this is a letter to Joseph Stalin. It says this, It is furthermore imperative to put the propaganda of atheism on solid ground. This is not like textbook. This is a letter. We, this is a, we need to do this in order to accomplish something. You won't achieve much with the weapons of Marx and materialism as we have seen. Materialism and religion are two different planes, and they don't coincide. If a fool speaks from the heavens and the sage from a factory, the fool would be the religious person, the sage would be the wise person that's working, they won't understand one another. The sage or wise person needs to hit the fool with his stick or with his weapon. For this reason, there should be courses set up at the Communist Academy which would not only treat the history of religion and mainly the history of Christ, the Christian church, i.e. the study of church history, as politics. He goes on to say, we need to know the fathers of the church, the apologists of Christianity. We need to know the church history of church schisms, heresies, the Inquisition, the religious wars, and so forth. Every quotation by a believer is easily countered with dozens of theological quotations which contradict it. Remember, their goal is to, to remove religion from, from their world. We cannot do it, he says, without an addition of the Bible. With critical commentaries from the, from the Tubingen school, I'm not sure if I said that right, and books on criticism of biblical texts, which could bring a very useful confusion into the minds of believers. Can I just stop and say, they are saying, we need our Bible with commentaries. And I looked up this school, this Tubingen school. This was just a, a group of people, a group of Bible scholars that happened to be on the more liberal side. And, they, and this, this Russian leader, was, this communist leader, was writing to Joseph Stalin and said, we could use this because we could use their criticism of the Scriptures, we create our own Bible edition, and we can cause confusion in the minds of believers. He goes on to say this, It is necessary to produce a book on the church's struggle against science. Right? Because science becomes God, and you interpret that however you want to interpret it, but it replaces God. He goes on to say this, Our youth is very poorly informed on questions of this nature. The tendency toward a religious disposition is very noticeable, a natural result of developing individualism. There's so much here. This, please let this sink in. Religion is a natural result of developing individualism. Okay? So, what would the opposite of that be? A developing non-individualism. That means all of us are just one group. We are all together. That's pretty much what the, the booklet from the governor said I read through this week. We're all together. We're all one. And we are not individuals. So the less individuals, individualism we have, the less religion the people pushing that on us have to worry about. I'll put these up somewhere where you can see them so that you can let them sink in. I want to read this letter to you from Lenin to Russian leaders. All right? This is to a very small group. Some of the words here I'll stop and explain as we go. This is basically to like the Russian... Uh, legislator. If, if they don't have, it's not like that. It's not like our legislator, but, but something like that. A, a lawmaking group in Russia. All right, this was back, this would have been about probably 1917. This is 1922. This one was written. 1922. Listen, that's 98 years ago. It seems like forever ago, like this couldn't ever happen again, but it's not that long ago. A generation and a half. All right, so this is what Lenin says to his group of leaders right underneath him. He says this, part of the letter. Now and only now, when people are being eaten in... Did you catch that? Okay, people are being eaten in famine-stricken areas, and hundreds, if not thousands, of corpses lie on the roads. We can, and therefore must, pursue the removal of church property 
with the most frenzied and ruthless energy and not hesitate to put down the least opposition. Now and only now, the vast majority of peasants will either be on our side or at least will not be in a position to support to any decisive degree this handful of, now here's their name, Black Hundreds clergy. This is against the church. And reactionary urban petty bourgeois, all right, middle class is what that is, who are willing and able to attempt to oppose the Soviet decree with a policy of force. I, I just want to break that down just, just quickly. First of all, let me go back to this. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And it goes on. He's saying this. The people are so hungry right now, they're eating other people. Now would be the time to confiscate church property. We'll take it away from churches and we'll say that this is to feed the poor. And when we do that, the poor will support us because they need this. They're dying, they're eating each other, so we can get by with this now. All right, that's the setting. There's a group of people opposing that. That is the clergy. The, in this case, the priests of the, I believe, probably the Russian Orthodox Church, right? But not just the priests. There's the middle class. And these groups of people will oppose us. The peasants won't oppose us because they're starving. This group of people, if anybody's going to, going to oppose us. So he goes on in his letter to say this. We must pursue the removal of church property by any means necessary in order to secure for ourselves a fund of several hundred million gold rubles. What's the reasoning? To get their money. In order to get our hands on this fund of several hundred million gold rubles, and perhaps several even several hundred billion, we must do whatever is necessary. But to do this successfully is possible only now. All considerations indicate that later on we will fail to do this. For no other time besides that of desperate famine will give us such a mood among the general mass of peasants that would ensure us the sympathy of this group, or at least would ensure us the neutralization of this group in the sense that victory in the struggle for the removal of church property unquestionably and completely will be on our side. He says this, one clever writer on statecraft correctly said that if it is necessary for the realization of a well-known political goal to perform a series of brutal actions, then it is necessary to do them in the most energetic manner and in the shortest time, because masses of people will not tolerate the protracted use of brutality. If we're going to be brutal, which we're going to be, because this is our goal, we're going to brutally take away what belongs to other people, these, these churches. We're going to have to be brutal and we're going to have to do it quickly because otherwise they won't tolerate it. Therefore, he says, this is Lenin writing this to his leaders, I come to the indisputable, indisputable conclusion that we must precisely now smash the black hundreds clergy most decisively and ruthlessly and put down all resistance with such brutality that they will not forget it for several decades. And he said, send to Shuaya, this is the location, S-H-U-I-A, send to Shuaya, one of the most energetic, clear-headed, and capable members of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee. In Shuaya, he must arrest more if possible, but not less than several dozen representatives of the local clergy. The local petty bourgeois and the local bourgeois, that's the middle class again, on suspicion of direct or indirect participation in the forcible resistance to the removal, the removal of property of value from churches. Here's his orders. He's got to go to this town and he's got to arrest several dozen and say that their crime is they were resisting the government taking the church's property. Immediately upon completion of this task, he must return to Moscow and personally deliver a report to the full session of the Politburo, that would be like their legislature, or two specially authorized members of the Politburo. On the basis of this report, the Politburo will give a detailed directive to the judicial authorities, also verbal, that the trial of the insurrectionists from Shuaya for opposing aid to the starving 
Did you get that? They weren't opposing aid to the starving. They're opposing the government taking their property. But the government says they're opposing aid to the starving because that helps the starving to be on the government's side. For opposing aid to the starving should be carried out in utmost haste and should not and should end not other than with the shooting of the very largest number of the most influential and dangerous of the black hundreds in Shuaia, and if possible, not only in this city, but even in Moscow and several other ecclesiastical centers. I skipped a bit, but at the end it says, appoint those who are especially responsible from among the best workers to carry out these measures in the wealthiest Lara's monasteries and churches, signed Lenin, March 19, 1922. So what you have here is this. Throughout history, you have world leaders who have, as, as Psalm said, raged, imagined vain things, set themselves, take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, and also against His people. That's not what the Bible says, but you see that over and over. And throughout history, world leaders have embraced false religion instead of Jesus, and populations have followed them without discernment. I want to show you that in the book of Revelation. It's in Revelation chapter 17. Pastor Blake read this to us not too long ago. Revelation 17, 1. All right? The Bible says this. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. This great whore the Bible talks about is false religions, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. That's the leaders. The people we've been talking about, the leaders of, of, of the world, world leaders, leaders of humanity, they have committed fornication, these, these immoral relationships with false religion. And if you go on, Revelation 17, 2, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the kings are... Put, bringing these together, this, this, if you want to call it an unholy marriage, I've heard that term before, of a government and a religion. The, the leaders of the world are pulling the governments and the religions together, and the people are made drunk by that, so they're following without any discernment. And then throughout history, false religions have made, been made wealthy by the government. And in 17, Revelation 17, 4, you see that. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Who made these false religions so wealthy? Well, it was the governments that supported them. And throughout the, the world leaders, the leaders that are raging against God, the worlds that are, that are rejecting Jesus Christ and have a conspiracy or have taken counsel together against God and against His anointed in verse 6, we see throughout history, false religions have been empowered by governments to persecute Christians. Revelation 17, 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Not like, a wow, this is awesome, but this is so horribly frightening. All right, so you see this setup. We're going to go through the rest of this quickly. How will God respond to the world's rejection of Jesus? Back in Psalm chapter 2, the Bible says this in verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sword as pleasure. How is God going to respond to the world's rejection of Jesus? The world's persecution, the leader's persecution of his people? Well, laughter, not fear, not worry. God's not bothered by their plans to overthrow his work on this earth. The Bible says derision or mockery. God will mock their plans. Much like in the Tower of Babel, the people got together, let's build a tower up to heaven, and God's come, God comes down and says, no, you're not. And he changes their language, and he mocks their work, mocks their effort. Not only laughter and derision, but the Bible says there in verse number 5, then shall he speak unto them in his wrath. He'll laughter, derision, and speaking, this judgment. God will speak to them in his wrath. Some will be judged while they live on this earth. Nebuchadnezzar was judged that way. Maybe remember that story, Nebuchadnezzar, God came to him through this dream, and I won't tell you the whole story because we don't have time, but Nebuchadnezzar ended up living for years out in, the, out in the field, and he became basically an animal out in the field, and then God restored him, he repented, he got right with God, God judged him during this time on earth, he got right with God, he repented, and I believe 
very likely became a believer at that point. When you look at some of the things that he says right after that, it's just an amazing the transformation in Nebuchadnezzar's heart. Some will be judged well on this earth, and, and maybe they, they turn to God. Some will seem to get away with rejecting God on this earth and get away with persecuting millions of, of people, and uh, whether they're believers or not believers, but persecuting millions of people. They may seem to get away with it, but they'll be judged and punished in eternity. The Bible says God will laugh at them. He will have them in derision. He'll speak unto them in His wrath and vex them in His sore displeasure. Vex means to plague, torment, or harass. God will judge. I want you to see in verse number 6 that God has a plan. We've got world leaders that hate God. We've got local leaders that hate God. But God has a plan. Look at verse number 6. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. God's got a plan. He'll set up his king in his kingdom. This is spoken in the past tense, as if, as if it already happened. Did you see that in Psalm 2, verse 6? Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. It's so for sure, it's as if it's already happened. Jesus will rule as king forever in Zion, for a thousand years in Jerusalem, and then forever in the new Jerusalem. God's had, God has a plan. He'll set up his king in his kingdom. God already had established the decree that his son would be the king before Jesus was born. Do you see that in verse number 7? I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my, capital S, son, this day have I begotten thee. Already before Jesus was born, he established this decree. Six, seven, eight hundred years before Christ was born, Jesus existed before Jesus was born. You need to understand that. He was God ever since before the beginning of time. He became a man when he was born, but he's been God from before the beginning of time. So God has this plan, and then God promised His complete support to His Son, who would be the King. Oh, this is so good to see. This is so comforting to see. Look at verse number 8. God says to His Son, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Yeah, the, the, the ones that are raging against you, I'm going to give you those. Verse 9, Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces, like a potter's vessel, God has a plan, and God promised complete support to His Son. Like a letter, parents, you'd understand this, like a letter that you would write to your child the day they were born. I've got a Bible, and in the front cover of my Bible, I've got a note written to me by my dad. It says something like this, David, I bought this Bible for you the day you were born. And I remember sometimes, this is so unspiritual, I would rather read that note from my dad than the Bible, right? Because it just had that comforting effect when I was away from home. This letter that God wrote to, to his, his own son, he says, This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance. Let me tell you something, son. You have my complete support. God promised to give his king son anything he asked for. Ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen for your inheritance. Ask of me, and I'll give you the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. God promised also to make his king son always victorious. He said, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, remember before you get upset. These are the kings and rulers that reject God. They reject Jesus and murder millions of followers of Christ. And God says, you will have possession of them. You will rule them with the rod of iron, and you will dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And then Jesus goes on and passes that same promise to Christians who will rule with him during his reign on the earth. I don't understand this completely, but I'm going to read it to you, and you'll see Re Revelation chapter 2, verse number 26. The part I don't understand is why. I really don't, there's a lot of whys I don't understand in the Bible, but God said to Jesus, listen, you have my total support. Those people that have raged against you, rejected you, persecuted you. And listen, when you persecute Christians, you persecute Jesus. That's exactly what Jesus said when he was talking to Saul. He says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me when Saul was persecuting Christians? Revelation 2, 26, Jesus says this, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he, who's the he, was the he that overcometh. It's not talking about Jesus. This is Jesus doing the talking. 
And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Listen, even as I received of my father. God has a plan. God's not worried about the heathen that rage against him. God's not worried about the kings and the rulers that, that persecute him and, and fight against him. And then God gives some advice to them. God's advice to the world and local leaders. Oh, they need to hear this. They have needed to hear this throughout history. They need to hear this now. Psalm chapter 2, verse 10. God's advice to these kings, these rulers, these judges that rage against God, that take counsel together against God, against Jesus. He says this, Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. And ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Then he finishes with, Blessed are they that put their trust in him. God's advice to world and local leaders, and we're done. First of all, get wisdom and instruction. If you are a leader, if you're a king, you need to get wisdom. Interestingly enough, this is the same thing that God offers in the Bible. See, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction. That's exactly what he said these kings and leaders need to get. And uh, to perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom. Justice and judgment and equity. To give subtlety to the simple. To give the, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain to wise counsels. Verse 7 says this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So a king or a ruler that despises God, that takes counsel against the Lord, God calls them a fool. But if they would be instructed, if they would get wisdom, the Bible goes on and tells them what they should do. It says, get in wisdom and instruction, serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling. That's an interesting combination of God, I know you are God, I'm not God, and I'm so glad you're God, and I do fear sinning against you. I do fear the punishment for sin, but I am so full of joy with the relationship I have with you. Then he says, kiss the son. Interesting thought, kiss the son. To kiss the ruler was a symbol of submission and respect. You see people go into the Vatican, and they'll kiss the Pope's ring or hand or something like that, toes. Um, you go to, uh, okay, Judas. He betrays Jesus with a kiss. Uh, Moses goes out to meet his father-in-law. He meet, greets him with a kiss. The Bible says he does. He did obeisance and kissed him. It was, it was respect, submission. Uh, Samuel, when he anointed Saul, the Bible says, uh, he poured the oil upon his head and kissed him. Kissing the son, in this case, is the kissing of, of the king. It's, you are the king, I'm your subject. Submission and respect. Can you imagine the rulers of our world subjecting themselves, humiliating themselves to the point where they kiss the son of God? Can you imagine Herod kissing Jesus? Pilate kissing Jesus. Not in a homosexual kind of way like our, like our world would try to get us to think but in a submissive kind of way. You're the king and I'm not. Listen, Jesus is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. If you acknowledge him as king, you'll be blessed. If you refuse to acknowledge him as king, you'll perish. You see that in Psalm chapter 2, verse number 12. Uh, Kiss the son lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. And last, advice to local leaders and world leaders. First it says, get wisdom and instruction. Get that from the word of God. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son, that means submission and respect to the Son of God, and then last, trust the Son. Trust Him. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Everyone who trusts Jesus, the Son of God, and the rightful King of the earth will be blessed. Now you can trust Him for everything, whether it's, whether it's your budget, whether it's your, your wisdom, whether it's your leadership, or whether it's your soul. We'll finish with this. If you've not trusted Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one that this whole chapter of Psalms is about, you need to trust Him as your Savior.
You need to realize that you and I are sinners. We all deserve to die and go to a place called hell. But if you would trust Jesus Christ to forgive your sins, the Bible says He would forgive you, He would save you, He'd remove your sins, He'd remove your guilt, He would make you a child of God, and you'd have eternal life. What a thought. Father, I pray that you would use, oh wow, so much information tonight. I pray that you'd use your word, though. And I pray that you would use your word to convict us and to challenge us. Lord, I pray that you would use your word to, to change us. Lord, we live in a world where kings and rulers, for the most part, they don't respect Jesus. In fact, they've done everything they could to tear him down. We live in a world that if people could get away with it, they would destroy any opportunity we have to worship. They take away our property. They would take away our lives if they could. Lord, we see that even now across the world. Lord, I ask that in our lives, the people that are in authority over us, Lord, I ask that they would get wisdom. I ask that you would help them to understand that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. And I ask that you would help them to make decisions in such a way that that uh, demonstrates that they fear God. And Lord, uh, last, I just, well, two more things. I'd ask that they would submit themselves to Jesus, and, and then last, that they would trust Him. Lord, I, I know that that would change everything about a person. The Bible said, you said that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. And Lord, I ask that you would do that. We, we so need that. Lord, thank you for Psalm chapter 2 that reminds us that no matter who is in charge or who the king on this earth is, Jesus is king, and he's king forever, and we can have peace in that.